And so in the womb, it's as if you know all of that and it's already been accepted and there's just a slight smile involved. Like, we've got this, Here we're, we're about to engage, ready to go again. My, my, my intention this time is to remember, is to not forget, is to stay more lucid all the way through, all the way through that birth canal and to you know, move into that, that gig on Earth. It is evolution. We are evolving human consciousness from the third dimension to the fifth dimension, we can we can grok that, we can wrap our minds around that. But I have lucid memory of being on the planet at the time that the pyramids were, were being built. And it was definitely orchestrated by another dimension. The skies were open, there was information pouring in. I, I participated in this as part of what was generating a uh, a, a vibrational frequency that was so intense that the heavy lifting of these stones uh, was happening through levitation and Dr. Sue Mortar, welcome back on the show. Such a gift to have you here. The last time we started, I asked you what you were most excited about right now in your life. And you answered that you're finding a new deepening space that can hold even more than you've been teaching for the last 25 years. And you're feeling an animation of greater of a greater version of love that you believe not a lot of humanity has tapped into. So mm. I'd love to open up the space if you are willing to go there of what are you deepening right now in your awareness, in your consciousness, in your life in general that is lighting a spark in you right now? Well, one of the things that has happened since that conversation is truly an application of more and more of this surrender to the vibrational frequency of love in the body, just feeling the vibration and allowing the mind to become acclimated to what the ecstatic frequency of true love is and unconditionality, it, it's bliss. It's truly a ananda as it's referenced in, in, uh, in, in the ancient East. And, and so the more time I have spent in that vibration, in within my own system, the more it has translated into a vibrational um, connection and an, an, an intonement or a coherence, a resonance with deeper energy centers in my own system, which taps into the solar plexus in which the mind field is really anchored. The mental body of energies is anchored in our own solar plexus and so it's been amazing what's unfolded simply by allowing the vibration of love to be more present in the body for more minutes a day if you will what begins to happen things begin to ignite and alight and so so the what what has happened in my world is i've been able to build circuitry to sustain that which is really the work that I'm interested in bringing to humanity. And, mm. and in doing so, my mind has changed a lot in its awareness of higher and higher truths, higher and higher frequencies um, dropping into the system and turning into perceptions and ideas and thoughts and interpretations and collaborations that are that, that were unseen as, po as possible, that were not perceived before. Um, it, everywhere in, from my personal relationships in my life all the way to being able to read ancient texts or see the hieroglyphs and the sacred trips and the journeys that I take around the world or to look into the paintings or the statuary of these sacred spaces and see what was a greater truth that was embedded in them that was truly um, concealing teachings 
in a manner that we're allowing them to be held safe at a time on our planet where it wasn't safe to be interpreting anything that was self-empowering or asserting the idea that we have a direct connection to source and that and that we are completely capable of that on an individual basis and so my entire world is really unfolding quite rapidly i'm i'm in the process of of writing another book and and drawing this information together in in ways that will allow people to 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 truly just walk themselves through these these principles and the how to of allowing this beautiful vibrational frequency of a greater love to infuse them uh, in a in a cellular manner and to turn on different genetic patterns and codes and and generate different neurotransmissions and hormonal chemistries etc that can truly guide our ability to self heal and our ability to awaken to the divinity that we truly are this the multi dimensionality i consider them one and the same and uh, when there's enough love in the picture um they are one and the same and mm. uh so there's a long answer to your question but but it's affecting every every area of my life it's it's affecting uh my physiology it's it's affecting my relationships it's affecting my perception of my purpose on the planet and what we are each capable of doing in in amazing transformative ways mm, beautiful and before we dive really deep into what was that greater truth of reality that the ancients knew i wanted to reflect this quote back to you this is what you said in a lecture um that says when we don't have the idea that our personal power and our ability to love are supposed to be connected, when we don't have that as a walking, working reality, we think we either have to be loving or powerful. And I think that's in many ways the state, the state that humanity is in right now, um, where it's that rise of the feminine. It's that rise, again, as the masculine, um, those two forces, um, which you could even say, maybe are that heart and that solar plexus together, the willpower and then the love. Where do you see those two standing um, in terms of the collective of human consciousness and how they can start working together to not have to choose between power and love and bring those two to merge? I think that is the reason for our continuing to come to this planet and to move through the obstacle course that that the third dimension offers us to allow us to come down through our faculties of force and power for survival and then to our faculties of strategizing and logic and and pushing with the with the left brain the, with the masculine qualities of the mind into um, this assertion that has landed us in this place but to go further uh, meaning the the state of, that humanity is in right now, confused and you know fearful and disoriented and so forth, and to continue to further that and to further refine it, to move into a state of um, true understanding and compassion, and to allow the right brain to come forward in in its guidance and its leadership, which we have typically not aligned with power uh, and our artistic qualities or our essence, our deep inner knowing and wisdoms that we would bring forth beyond logic. We haven't really given that as much credibility in our past as we have some of the forceful strategic battle plans that we come up with in terms of living life and making things happen and being successful and accomplishing our visions and our goals for ourselves. It's, it's ultimately it is the human victory to awaken to its divinity. And that cannot happen when there's an imbalance or a dysregulation inside of our own system between the masculine and feminine energies. Our autonomic nervous system completely thwarts and distorts and gets caught in fight or flight and we're stuck there. Or we go to the opposite extreme trying to flip the switch in another direction and we stymie, we get into freeze where we're 
unable to engage or do what we would love to do or what we would love to see happen in our lives, we don't have the wherewithal to initiate it or to lead it or to create in these ways. And so, so our ultimate destiny is to allow these two energies that you're, that you're speaking of to find each other, to meld together, to unify, in fact, so that they're not two separate energy centers. They're not two separate qualities that we possess. They're not two choices that we have to make, but that they're merged into the greatest power that humanity will ever experience, which is the true empowerment of the love that we are. You know, when, when we move from the unified field, we begin compressing and compressing and compressing our consciousness to come all the way here to the physical dimension. And the very first compression generates a vibration. And that vibrational frequency is the frequency that we call love. So everything that's built after that is based in love. It's the foundation of our existence. And so when we turn the mind on to that love and we allow the magnifying, intensifying qualities of the mind to to be fueling the power of this love, the love expands in our reality, in our perceptive field, to the point that we see that there's no better choice than the loving one. There is no better way of being than to encourage everyone around us, even if we think that we need to get our own or we need to make a way for ourselves, that the best way to do that is to support other people in doing the same and to recognize that all of it is you. All of it is my consciousness. And so if I'm not willing to withhold the love that is true about me, then I will get to experience the bigness of my being. If I withhold the love that is true about me because I don't want it to be hurt or I don't want to appear to be too giving or I don't want someone to take my information or to take my gifts in some way and use them or misuse them, um, all of that is fear-based reality. It's a fear-based reality. And if we want to walk up out of that reality and into another one, then we have to find uh, the, the power to do so. And that power is the power of love magnified by the solar plexus. So when those two are unified, then we are truly moving forward in a very different way into a very different reality. We find different solutions when someone poses a problem, when someone voices a complaint or is agitated with us, we can see that they are agitated and we can be available to help support their agitation and to quell it and to calm it instead of their agitation activating in a fear or an agitation within myself and then us going at it in some defensive sort of way there's an entirely different approach to living life. Likewise, somebody's looking toward a goal or a vision for themselves. Um, there's no reason that isn't supposed to manifest if it occurs and appeals to someone. If it's if they're sitting in their heart and something truly appeals to them, it's meant to be for them. If they're in their heads and they're just strategizing and they're just trying to get ahead, then something else will unfold. But if we truly want to experience our our true nature and flourish. It is truly harmonizing these masculine and feminine energies of, of love and movement, love and action. And the action of the mind is, is, is anchored in that solar plexus. And so it's, it's time for us to, to allow those two to find each other. And, and the best place to do it is in our own living laboratory of our own body and to learn to build the circuits for those two to interact and to become one, to be unified, to marry and uh, when they do, harmonizing happens and we start elevating and raising our, our true, full, whole selves uh, to a new level. And we've heard so many times intellectually, like you are a multidimensional being and some people might have that very much in their head. And I realize that a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the depression, a lot of the, these, these emotions come about because we forget where we came from and we forget who we truly are. And you have a very active memory of the moment that you chose to become in the moment that you came into this physical reality, which we touched on a little bit in our first interview, which was what, what is this physical reality? Um, this multidimensional construct. 
And you said that you experienced, you remembered experiencing that dissension and you remembered being in that womb space. Walk us through that experience for people because we all had to come out through a womb, right? So we might already have had a similar experience as you, but you remembered it. And mm -hmm. what was that like? Mm -hmm. What insights did you download from just having that remembrance of that experience? Sure. You know, the, the quality of the experience, of course, was poignant and very lucid and very present. But it was also what was happening. It was just what's happening. It wasn't phenomenal. It wasn't mind blowing. It like was, a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. It which which from from an earthly human perspective, we would think that remembering such a thing would be fantastical. But when you're in it, it's exactly appropriate. It's just it's exactly what we're doing. So it's like if someone slips and falls, uh, you're walking in the mall and someone slips and falls, the natural thing to do is go, just lean. You, you, your body just goes to see, are you okay? Um, and if it was less of an urgent situation, if somebody walks up and says, hello, I'd like to introduce myself, you naturally turn and open yourself to see what this is about. And likewise, if, if there is food on the table in front of you, the natural response is you know, to partake in it. And when we love someone and we care, the natural response is to want to express that to them or to share or to connect in some way. And, and the moment that we are in the choice of becoming, the moment that it is as if the words are spoken, yes, I am. It is big. It is massive. There are mountains of energies that are moving together to formulate this presence of an energy being, a collection of energies that then gather and compress and compress and descend and descend and descend. It is big. We are definitely lucid and plugged in. We're not distracted by any means. It's what is. And then landing in the womb is exactly appropriate. It's what's next to be. It there was nothing to decide or there was no thought about it. It was completely present, completely here and awake and available to, to absorb and to exchange. And the exchanges with the womb environment and with the environment outside the womb were natural. There was no filtering process. There was no reason to, there was no thought at all. It was simply presence that was yes, that was a yes. It felt much more like a yes than anything else is the best way for me to describe. It is what I know humanity seeks to connect with when they are taught to or drawn to develop the observing mind, the presence, the awareness that is more at the foundation of our being than the thinking analytical strategizing mind. And so when we do, when we've already learned how to tap into the observing mind and we've learned how to be lovingly present instead of trying to fix or change things or instead of thinking or evaluating or judging the things and putting them in a compartment, but just witness, just witnessing. We're, we, when we've already learned how to do that, we're close to the state that we are in as a conscious being in the womb, readying to enter itself into this dimension on its own fully, in its own vehicle, in the birthing process. And so it's not trying to learn to develop the observing mind. It's already have, having developed it. So everyone has this component in them. Everyone has already been experiencing this, but we have a tendency to make it extraordinary and something difficult to achieve. And so we separate ourselves from it. We put it over there and make it something I'm trying to learn how to do. When in reality, you've already done this. If you've ever, um, if you've ever taken a nap in, in, on a, on a springtime day that you didn't have to be doing anything, you were nowhere and you just didn't even plan on taking a nap. You just sat back in your chair and you just kind of drifted to sleep. 
And then at some point you drifted back to wake, uh, wakefulness and you looked around the room and you saw something before your mind kicked in. You were that, you were that. If you've ever been sitting on the beach and just had this warm sun on you, it's just the right, you know, just waves coming, nothing to think about, nothing to achieve. We're just, we're there. And it is, it's that kind of an essence that, that is at the foundation of our consciousness. And the significance of that, the reason we want to know about that is that if we can return there and live there and just be that, we have access to billions of bits of information that are constantly nurturing us. It's not information like, let me get that, let me catch it, let me learn it. It's nutrients. It's, it's uh, as like a plant would absorb the sunshine. We are absorbing this cosmic information, this cosmic love, this divine presence. It's what it is. It feeds us. It's us. It is us. And it's constantly coming in and, and replacing and replenishing and rejuvenating and creating a new presence here, another new presence here. I'm new again today. I'm, I'm beginning again today. I'm always that. And when we're, when we can learn about that and perceive it, we realize that there's nothing to defend. There's only, there's only here. There's only what is. And I'm whole and complete and completely capable of anything that I would choose. I have access and unlimited capacity to reinvent myself or to come forward or to take action or to just lean in and reach out and initiate and engage or sit back without fear of missing out or anything along those lines to just celebrate. And so in the womb, it's as if you know all of that and it's already been accepted and there's just a slight smile involved. Like, we've got this here, we're, we're about to engage, ready to go again. My, my, my intention this time is to remember, is to not forget, is to stay more lucid all the way through all the way through that birth canal and to, you know, move into that, that gig on earth, uh, and not splat, not disperse myself, not sell out, not, you know, become, uh, convinced that this, this movie that I'm moving into this illusionary world that I'm moving into so that I can practice my faculties. Um, I'm not going to believe that it's, you know, the reality. I'm going to remember that I'm the creator of my reality and, and then, you know, when that time is ready, we, we begin, we actually engage um, to initiate the birth. There was a conscious choice of, okay, I'm, I'm on the move, I'm moving. And, and it isn't like we were pulled into something that we weren't ready for. We're, we're focused up, completely lucid, and we're on the move. We know what we're doing. There is consciousness to the process. And this is something that, you know, I don't know if people ever even think about that. Uh, I certainly had never thought of it until I was mm. experiencing it. And, um, and then in the compressive forces, I don't have a lot of memory right in the birth canal, but I do have memory of that breath coming in, <laughs> that ah, influx of uh, additional space spirit, essence, breath, um, igniting the, the system, turning it on, just like turning on the engine. It's like, da, got it. And, and then here we are. I guess the, the largest thing that I'd like to impre impress upon people is that we are whole and complete sitting there. We know it, there is nothing, there's no concern about the journey ahead. We totally know what it's about. And, and, and it's in that comp further compression through the birth canal, literally, physically, that, that the vibrational atonement of our, of our physical structure is compressed and quickened. And in that quickening process, we, we become so lucidly present to that now moment that, um, we, we forget. It's like, you know, for thoughts to happen or for anything to happen in the cosmos, vibration has to be happening. Something has to move for anything to be real, to become. This is quantum science. And so, so the same is true in, 
in thoughts and in per- perceptions or interpretations of what we're perceiving and and conclusions that we would then draw and uh, ideas that we would then come up with. That all happens um, when there's elbow room, when there's room for vibration to occur, when there's room for movement. And inside the birth canal, it was, is, it was as if oh, all that is stilling. There's just, there's so much, uh, it's packed so tight. There's no room for, for that lucid and the analysis in, in sorts. And so consequently, we, we don't, we, we come out the other side and we forget, we've forgotten what, what it was that, that, that intention was until it's, until it starts to reoccur to us when we expand again into our true state. And, and, and so when we're forgiving, when we're loving, we're in expansive energies. And those energies of expansion allow that elbow room to return and for that those truths to begin cycling in a way that can rise to our conscious mind and we can have uh we can have remembrances, we can recall, oh, I understand how to interpret this situation. I can read between the lines. I've got this wisdom rising. I no one's taught me this, but it's here inside of me. And every single one of us is made of that. But mm. we aren't raised to even dial into it, much less how to translate it or interpret it. And so that's what I love, you know, putting together for people, teaching them how to find their way to listen in and to learn and to perceive and receive those wisdoms again, so that we can get about doing what we came here to do. Mm, That was very profound, Dr. Sue. Thank you for that. Um, When you mentioned the word intention, it brought me back to a conversation that we were having with Gary Zukoff, uh, the scribe, channel, author of Seed of the Soul. And one of the most powerful teachings that I received from that book was that everything starts with an intention. And every intention has an effect um, out in, in, the, in the material world. So when you mentioned that we all had an intention coming in, how diverse is that intention or is it like one intention that then ripples out and then we all get to experience it in a different way how do you see that do you remember what was your exact intention coming in sure um you know the the that when i speak about intention i'm speaking about the intention that we feel that we allow to rise from within that our impulse, our evolutionary impulse to evolve, uh, the impulse of evolution is rising in every one of us. It's what we're made of. We're made of this combination of energies that is collectively here processing itself through this recycling and recycling and becoming more and more aware and focused and lucid. And what we're supposed to be focusing on is the information that is rising and that is rising, that is rising through through this body that we are we are the universe, we are the cosmos, we are consciousness itself that has funneled itself, compressed itself into a funnel, compressed itself into a channel that has descended and hit the earth and is rising in this toric field process. It rises as high as it can go and then it fountains around and then it uptakes that energy again and shoots it up and it's constantly recycling. It's constantly being replenished. It's constantly hitting the earth and then rising up from the earth and and rejuvenating and replenishing. And so intention is tending inward. Our intentions are are to rise to our awareness, but we don't do that as a humanity. We shove all that down and we get up here in our heads and we drive an intention. We decide, here's what I'm gonna go do because they're doing it and if they can do it, I can do it. I'm gonna go make this happen. And it's overuse of the masculine part of our mind. We're overly asserting and we're not waiting for the wisdom to rise to tell us what we should be pursuing, what's truly in our alignment, what's truly our path. And so when we listen for our intention, when we perceive our intention from deep in our core, we know, and it's un, it's immovable, it's unwavering. There, No one can knock me off of that. It's like, it's what I am, I can feel it. No one can talk me out of it because it's what's true. I just have to learn to train my mind to be devoted to that in a way that it will stay on this true rising soulful self instead of 
you know, allowing for uh, my mind to suppress that and take over. And so, so the, yes, the, your question about, is there a collective intention? It is evolution. We are evolving human consciousness from the third dimension to the fifth dimension. We can, we can grok that. We can wrap our minds around that. And we become curious about it enough that we're studying what are the qualities of the fifth dimension, the fourth dimension, the third dimension. How do I start to organize my mind to even know that I'm progressing in that way? But every one of us is contributing to the evolution of human consciousness. That's, that's the big intention. And then as it ripples out, we also are taking that on in our own each individual ways as soulful selves that are coming in to further refine themselves. Different versions of different, uh, different us's, <laughs> different people have different um, qualities that they are here to refine. Some people are here to to learn to trust their deep core. Some people are here to learn courage. Some people are here to learn forgiveness. Some people are here to uh, to find their voice and so forth. Many, many, many obviously different attributes that are here coming in to be refined. And when we each play our part authentically, we support one another in the process because really there's only one of us here. So really, we're all cells of a larger being that are learning how to pulsate together, that are learning how to become rhythmic and fluid with one another, that are learning how to connect the, the, the true aspects of our most refined conscious states. Here's what I mean by that. When we find our most refined, highest vibration within ourselves, it's the same in me as it is in you. If I can find the highest vibrational frequency of me, I match you. And so if we can both find ours, there's nothing separating us. Now we are more powerful than either one of us were at operating as an illusionary separate self at a lower vibrational frequency. And so I feel that we have to get off of the idea that yeah, I'm in it for me. I have to wake me up because I want to heal this for me and I want to succeed with this and turn it into like a bigger purpose. Because if we'll focus on the bigger purpose, the cosmic intelligence, the universal truth will support us in that endeavor. Because the truth of us is we are united. The truth of us is we are one thing that is trying to find its way into union again on a conscious level. And so the more we set our sights of being in service or helping each other or being, um, being uh, a, a willing to reveal, to being willing to reveal, then um, we are meeting in the middle. We're meeting in the space in between. And when we animate the space in between, there is no separation. So our individual intentions would do well to be, to be set upon what's in your heart, what's in your gut, what's in your deep core wisdom belly self, What's in that, that part of you that you turn to if you are devastated? That part of you that you turn to when you are afraid beyond words? Uh, that part of you that you turn to when you are hurt and buckled over because of something that has happened or a loss that has been perceived to, you know, to exist? And all of those things that take us deep into our core, unfortunately, they're usually painful. That's what usually it takes to get someone's attention to go there. But we can also go there by divine choice, by free will choice, consciously and intentionally to surrender. That's what that is. But if we will surrender with the same potency intentionally that we would be buckled over and forced into in the greatest loss that we have experienced, if we would, if we would become that passionate uh, intentionally, we can find the place where that common uh, ground is and where that true intention is rising from. Where that true intention is rising from is our very deep foundation of existence. And so people use their minds to set their intentions, but they do it as a separated mind that's just deciding, oh, I want this, I'm going to go after that. And and it's it's building the wrong world. It's building a world that isn't sustainable. It's building something that causes people to become sick, it causes them to become desperate, it causes them to become lonely, and it causes them to do that even more and push even harder because it seemed to work for a while. And so they just try to do the same thing again. 
and it it will never take us to satiation and fulfillment and gratification to our true destiny. It won't do that. What will do that is if we take that passion and that desire and we drop it inside and we allow that to ignite what's in there. And then that comes up and it's not logical necessarily, but it's loving. It's not necessarily what the Joneses are doing to get ahead, but it's yours. And it might not feel familiar, but if you look closely, it feels good. If you let it, it feels really good because you're blending back together the parts of who you are in a way that no one else can do for you. Nothing else will do for you. And so, so then we can set our intentions based upon what's, what's really in here, what's really, really wanting the life that it came here to have, what's really trying to speak, what really wants to come out. Instead of getting caught up and letting the mind run away with your worst fears and you're your obsessing with what's wrong or what might be wrong or what might go wrong, instead of letting your mind do that anymore, we're training it and we're welcoming it and we're bringing it home and giving it a better job. And when we do, our intentions become quite clear and we begin again as the true self. And, you know, if you can imagine the whole of humanity having the wherewithal to do that, learning how to do that, um, how we might end up treating each other differently, how we might end up appreciating each other more, how we might end up uh, truly in the place that we desire to be. Mm. And I know that last time we spoke, you were working on a graphic image depicting this process of how our own conscious evolution is a byproduct and also a contributor to that of the larger being that we inhabit, which is Gaia, planet Earth. Um, and that the more that we get to that level of consciousness, we remember what the indigenous people knew. So I'm really interested to know, because you've been to all these sacred sites in the world, because you've worked on the power spots around the world, what knowledge, what wisdom did these indigenous ancient people know that is starting to come up to the surface as we reach higher states of consciousness? Mm. Beautiful. So what they know, they don't know about things. They know things. They don't <laughs> know about truths. They are them. What the indigenous peoples are, are the animation of pure consciousness. They are the rivers and the mountains and the trees. They are. So when we have interpreted the sacred dances that the indigenous peoples would do, uh, we interpret it from the limited mind that is separated. And we interpret them as praying to something or praising that. They're celebrating the components of their wholeness. They're not wishing for something or trying to call it in. They're celebrating it. They're acknowledging all that they are. They don't know about it. They are the knowing that is. They are it. They are it. And, and this is what new generations are coming in to our humanity now, more open to uh, perceiving that. We're, we're winning. We are evolving. And younger generations are to totally open to this. And they get it and they're hungry for it. My biggest concern about the approach is that many people are desiring out-of-body experiences to accomplish the awareness of what we're speaking of, which is fine, but if they don't learn how to come into the body, they'll, with that, uh, or even discover it inside the body, they will never be able to animate it fully all the way down the spectrum to the full physical animation inside their human lives. And so they will be uh, aware but they and awake, but will they be embodied with that wakefulness? Because unless we're in the body, we don't heal. We heal when we come into the body. We heal our perceptions and our physical ailments when we are in the body. We transform when we are in the body. We change our ways of being when we action them into the world by a lucid, grounded 3D version. 
because that's why we came. We came to bring these higher dimensional versions of ourselves into the density of the third dimension and wake it up and elevate it. And by doing so, we are furthering consciousness. So we're on the frontier of consciousness when we are here, just by nature of being here, just by nature of directing our focused attention into the third dimension and bringing our whole selves here, that's what we're doing. So, so in that, we want to allow for the wholeness of this to occur. And so what I love about our younger generations that are coming in and lucidly being able to hold the space for this kind of conversation is that they're not having to unlearn because the generations before were willing to unlearn what they had been taught, which was a limited version of reality. And they were willing to unentangle, to spend time disentangling all of these limiting perceptions of who we are and what we're doing here. And because of that, they've created a landing pad where new generations are coming in and they're able to land here literally at a higher vibrational frequency than 100 years ago or 200 years ago. If you go back far enough, we were quite elevated, but we've gotten so caught up in paying attention to our outer world that our consciousness didn't keep up with what we were manifesting. And so, and so what's, what's now happened is generations are, have become aware of that's a problem. We can't do that. We can't keep manifesting faster than we can be conscientious and conscious about what we're manifesting. We have to bring the whole of us with us as we're inventing these things. Otherwise, it gets out of control. And that's what we're witnessing. We're witnessing a world that is just out of control. We've created ways of being and profit margins and industrializations that are generating, you know, how to tear down a planet. And, and we, we woke up to that. We saw, oh, wow, enough of us are doing something about it. And it's enough to make a difference. And it will make a bigger and bigger difference when more and more people join in. And now a younger generation is coming in and has a higher vibrational landing pad and they get it. They're lucid and they're vital and they're clear and they're passionate. And they're like, come on, let's do this. That's why we're having this conversation, right? That's what we're all doing here in this conversation. We're doing something about it in a higher, in a higher realm, uh, with the passion and the vitality for transformation to occur. And so in that, we are here to allow for this evolution to unfold in, in its own majesty. The indigenous peoples were all about that. We're returning to that state. We're returning, we are insisting on, I am not separate. I will not let you convince me that I need you to get to God or I will not let you convince me that I need to take that in order to be whole. That there, I have healing capacities and I have, I have uh, direct access to uh, all of it. We all do. And, and that's what's birthing in humanity right now. People are taking it back. They're claiming it back for themselves. And we have to learn how to do that with conscientiousness, with proper responsible stewardship, so that it truly does fall into place in a way that leaves this better than we found it, that allows for transformation to authentically and sustainably occur, which means taking our eye off of the individual and, um, and allowing ourselves to belong to a greater being, you know, which is the presence that the indigenous peoples were quite aware of. They were what is. They were not separate in any way. They weren't separate from each other. They were not separate from their, their place, their space, their elements, um, their gods. They were, it was all the same. And we're returning to that on a higher and more em empowered level, even, um, as we, as we proceed over the next, you know, millennia, we'll probably be accomplishing that in mass enough to be able to uh, tangibly look across the bandwidth of humanity and and see its its validity, its manifestation. Mm. And it almost seems like as we're raising in in a higher density, 
manifestation seems quicker as well like even people are going through their lessons even quicker there was a friend i hadn't seen in two months and i was like what's new and she's like i feel like i've lived seven lifetimes in the last two months which i think is just that time is speeding up and you know you mentioned this transition from third dimension or third density to to the fifth density Mm -hmm. I'm really curious because you mentioned that if we were to go far back enough, we would have seen this level of consciousness be inhabiting on Earth. Are you aware or do you have any insight of what might have happened for that consciousness to descend so that we avoid those mistakes? Because like even things with artificial intelligence where we're manifesting that very quickly with I don't know what what's quality of consciousness we're doing it with. Um, so yeah, what are your, what are your insights on going very far back? Maybe talking about the ancient Egyptians, um, Atlantis, maybe even further to understand what, what they were practicing, um, in their civilization. Sure. So you think about consciousness is expanding. Everything is expanding. Consciousness is expanding into that, which is not awake. It's waking. And as it's waking, it's, it's materializing, it's manifesting. And so you mentioned Lemuria. So ancient Lemuria was this liquid crystalline reality where we're moving from the aqueous solution that is just what the, what the cosmos is made of. And, and it's starting to formulate and formulate. And so here on this planet, as consciousness is coming into form, it comes through a liquid crystalline, uh, f- version of itself, as do we in the womb. Same, same. It's just a, microcosm macrocosm that we're speaking about here and so so as as consciousness of earth was moving through uh, it coming into its form it's moving through this liquid crystalline state and lemuria uh, was that so it's sort of like an egypt underwater but it wasn't underwater like under the ocean that that was what 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 existed in terms of consciousness on the planet at its early birthing states and so, and so, yes, we were, we think about creator is creating a creation, all right? Creative essence is formulating a structure, a creation, a, a thing. And, and so as creator is creating, creator is aware that it is creator creating and it creates a creation. And what happens, and we've just, we've spoken about this already today in a different way, but when we get, we're creating something, when we, when we create enough that it's tangible, we, we become distracted and start paying more attention to what we've created than paying attention to ourselves as creator creating. And so we got caught up in the bright, shiny things that got created, right? It's sort of like, that's a quick way to understand what I'm saying. We get distracted onto the object of creation instead of remembering we are the creator creating. And so, so the, the, the peoples that were present, the consciousness that was present at the time was fully aware that it was creator creating creations. It was creator manifesting things. And these are ancient Eastern principles and philosophies that I'm, that I'm speaking of. And it takes us back to the basic bottom line of who we are and what's going on. And so when we, when we've, as time passes and we create more and more and more, and there's more and more density that the, when the attention goes on to the creation itself, instead of staying on subject, on self as creator, we lose ourselves. We get lost in what we're creating. And that's what has happened. We, we started identifying out here as the people and the places and the things that are going on instead of identifying as this true creative capacity, the essence of creator itself that we each are. So the indigenous peoples at the time of Lemuria and at Atlantis and then in Atlantis, we split off in terms of becoming separate in our consciousness, paying more attention to the creation than remembering, wait a second, I'm creator and I'm responsible for everything that I'm creating versus we come over here onto object, onto the creation itself, and we get entangled there, took on a life of its own. And that's, you know, what, 
what the the history of ancient Lemuria into Atlantis and Atlantis being in struggle was the friction between the truth and the creation, you know, the, the truth and the byproduct of how we've been spending our attention. By putting too much attention on what what's what the material world is that's how that's how the ancient eastern principles would reference it uh we get too caught up in the material world and in and what they didn't mean like material world like um you know being materialistic in the way that we use the term today the term meant then the manifest world what's already been created we get caught up in that we get entangled in that and enmeshed in that instead of remembering that we are the gods and goddesses, we are the consciousness itself. We are the power to generate that if we, if we will just stay seated as the soulful self, as this pure presence. And so, so it's the dilemma of life on earth. It's why we come. We come to solve that puzzle. We come to get sucked into that, get caught up in that, and then to like stop because there's pain. There's pain if we do that. It's emotional pain, it's physical pain, it's relational pain, it's financial pain, you name it. It's a lack of abundance because we're disconnected and we're over here just focused on the world, the outer world. And the instructions have been pradyahara, bring your attention, you bring your, withdraw your senses, come back home. And the instructions are to find this river of life you know, this goes back to ancient India, ancient Egypt. All of them were referencing this river, river of life in a way that, that truly allows for us to return to this presence that is this channel, that is the center of the toric field, that is, you know, what I'm teaching people about finding how to find their way to that anchor and begin, just begin immersing yourself back into these vibrational frequencies that are what the indigenous ancient peoples we're doing, we're living as, you can do that too. So, so I'm hoping that this is a helpful explanation to, to allow us to come back, come back home to the self instead of, um, uh, allowing to have happen what happened. So that continued from Lemuria to ancient Atlantis to ancient Egypt, where the power of creating was so potent that, and we were so not grounded, we were blowing things up left and right. And the power of the mind is what, is what, is what ancient Egypt was all about, was the discovery of the power of the mind. And mm -hmm. they were struggling to the point that they sought, and this is in the Egyptian history books, uh, that they sought the assistance of a, civil, a higher civilization from another dimension that brought technology that helped us tether the mind, helped us to quell the mind, to master the mind. And it brought technology. This is in the history books. And the technology was what we call love, is the vibrational frequency. They brought a vibrational frequency into consciousness, into the, the experiments, the efforts that we were doing, um, and allowed us to quell the mind. And so you bet love is important when it comes to uh, our power if we don't want to blow things up or create too fast or create things that are going to crash us again and again and again. And so what humanity is up against right now, this isn't the first time that we've been here. It isn't the first time. We've obviously been here before. There have been civilizations that have come and gone. And it's truly a matter of will we get it right? Will we do it? Will we do it this time? You know, we're poised. We're in it right now. We're at choice point. And, you know, it's hard to believe that the solution would be love when there's so many crises going on and it seems so far from where we're operating with you know all of the 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 wars and the killing and the and the greed and the you know what we've become what we've allowed to happen it's hard to imagine that love could even hold a place at the table with such potent dissonant energies but there is a greater love it is at the foundation of our very existence. And we have the capacity to tap that. We have the capacity to reinvent ourselves and to rise with more power than we have ever had before. 
And it's happening. It's happening with a few. It's happening with some. It's happening with the people who are in this community listening to this interview. It's happening in our larger personal development, spiritual development, seeking, you know, finding um, community. And I would just love to steward that in a way that allow, I'd love for people to know how to steward it for themselves in a way that allows them to not, to not miss it, but to catch it and not miss this beautiful opportunity that we are sitting at right now in terms of how to put it together, how to align our power and our love and our, our presence and our, and our, and ground it in such a way that we can rise up and open up through, uh, beyond, above the, the primitive brain and activate and illuminate these high brain centers in a way that we can remember this stuff. We can see it and perceive it and get it and allow it to be the guiding light, the guiding force in our lives. As, as we do that as a collective, we can even impact those that are not doing that uh, by generating a vibrational reality in which they are forced to function and it changes things when love is in the air. We've all had that immediate personal experience. It changes things when love is in the air. It changes things. And so, so imagine groups of hundreds of thousands of people tapping into um, this coherence and this resonance and this embodiment piece um, so that we can turn the scales, turn the tides again, and give ourselves a chance to uh, re-up you know, to, to begin again and have a new starting point with how we go about approaching solving what appear to be problems and impressing and infusing ourselves as the light, high frequency energy beings that we truly are into these densities of this physical quagmire that we've created by an unattached mind, a, a meaning a mind that is disconnected, disembodied and, um, so I'll stop there and see where you want to go. Hmm. Many places, many places. Um, just today I was tuning into one of the conversations you had with Ibrahim Karim, uh, the founder of Biogeometry and his daughter uh, on your show on Gaia, uh, the Healing Matrix. And I was blown away by that conversation because it was really connecting so many dots for me as i was just coming from a trip to egypt um and it resonated so much what you said about they had to learn to master the mind you look at something like the pyramid and you're just standing there in awe of like how like how that was my only <laughs> my only question was like first it was like how and then it was like i understand um and <laughs> i'd really love to go even deeper into that of you know, the because Ibrahim, he had his own ideas about what were the purpose of these pyramids. And I'm very sure you have your own perspective and opinion on that as well, or knowing uh, uh, a deeper knowing of, of why they were placed there. What was the purpose? Um, and this interdimensional species that came to help, are they still are they still assisting us? Um, with that intention of bringing in that frequency of love uh, to the planet. Yes. So these are beautiful and deep questions. And I, <laughs> um, I guess the time is now for me to share these kinds of things in this kind of setting. I usually only share these things in kind of my deeper coursework where I know that people that are tuning in are, are plugged in and they're, we're in alignment and, and it's cool, you know, to exchange. Um, but I trust you, right? <laughs> I trust the world. So. My, my, my audience likes the advanced deep stuff, I, I, I believe. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, so I have lucid memory of being present on the planet. And it sounds crazy, but I have lucid memory of being on the planet at the time that the pyramids were, were being built. Yeah. And it was definitely orchestrated by another dimension. It was definitely orchestrated. The, the skies were open. There was information pouring in. And I was a, I, I participated in this as, um, as part of what was generating a, uh, a, a vibrational frequency that was so intense that the heavy lifting of these stones uh, was happening through levitation and vibrational frequency. Now, I sound like a crazy person. Now you have to remember I'm a doctor in a clinic and, and take Dr. Sue, so we're having we're having Matias De Stefano on the show in a couple of weeks. So don't worry. No yeah. one is crazy so, here. Yeah. Okay. So um you know I'm just commenting on, you know, my 
my peers, the, you know, people from, from the, my profession and so forth, I'm sure think I'm crazy. I thought I was crazy when these things started opening and happening in my own consciousness. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Was I ever going to talk about these things? And, you know, this is 25 years ago when I started having these memories. And, and for more than half of that time, I did not speak about it. Uh, not even in my communities where people were coming and learning and all of this. And then finally it kind of slipped out of my mouth at one point and people were all over it. They wanted to tell us more. And so I just started, you know, revealing it, uh, not wanting to, you know, discredit the, the profession that I came up through and, and being a doctor and having, you know, clinic and patients who trusted me and all that kind of thing. You know, if this person's crazy, you know, do we really want to, and you know what? It's not so crazy, especially when I look to the hieroglyphs and I see and I can read and I see what they say and I know what's going on. So I was this sphinx-like creature and I was receiving information from another dimension and it was being translated through me. And there was another one of me over there doing the same thing. And there was, there was immense information coming in. And it was something I had done thousands of times. I had done it before. I knew what I was doing. We were simply receiving this information. It was translating. We were bringing it as energy and bringing it and transducing it into the ability to do the heavy lifting. And there were beings that were there. Uh, there were ropes and, you know, boards and slants and ramps and pulleys and things like that as well. But that wasn't what was, that was, that was assistance. It, it was, it was so real. I can hear it. I can smell it. I can, I can be there right now. And this vibration that was coming out of uh, the sides of my head was contributing to the, what was happening there. There were, there were beings that were bigger than humans, but they were human shape. And there were beings that were smaller than humans, but they were human shape. And there were regular sized humans there. And there were other, other species there as well. And uh, this was happening as an interdimensional gateway. It was a it was a way to come in and out of the third dimension for many many different types. It, it was not a burial chamber. It had nothing to do with that. It was a life chamber. It was it was a, a reinforcement, a way to transduce and to step up or step down frequencies. And when you travel into the pit chamber beneath the pyramids. Uh, it puts you down into uh, sort of a chair pose in yoga uh, to get down because it you have to squat down. And when this energy folds over on itself, it becomes self-aware. We be, we embody in these ways. I teach all these things in my When body. we walk up the king's chamber? And then or when the... you, you go to the queen, you come back up out of yeah. the pit chamber and go to the queen's chamber. And it is there is a, a cutout in the wall that has a certain shape to it that is similar to the step pyramid that is in another part of, uh, of Egypt, just outside of uh, where the great pyramids are. And it shapes your field. It has a, an effect on the energy field. So, you know, when all these things, these memories started coming back, I could see people's energy field. And when they would step into that space, their field would become shaped. When you come out of the queen's chamber and go up the ramp to the king's chamber, the entire corridor is shaped the same way which maintains that shape, which is a stepping up toward this quickening in these high brain center areas. And, um, and it's, it's, it's causing us, it's shaping us into a version of a sacred geometry that allows for uh, truly a transcendental travel, if you will, uh, not just an experience, but a movement of, of the whole, the whole, you know, these are, there's so much to say about that. And the sarcophagus that is there in the king's chamber is um, not unlike the tomb that Jesus was placed into for ascension. It's, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. So, I laid there in December and we were with a group of people led by Robert Edward Grant. Um, he's a polymath mathematician. He's made a bunch of discoveries with the pyramids and we were told to resonate our voice in a certain tone while we were inside of the sarcophagus. And it was so wild because, you know, people were having crazy experiences, cellular, you know, movements and 
biological upgrades we'll say it like that um and while i was doing the toning inside of the sarcophagus it almost felt like it was like an engine turning on it was like mm, like a wobble like it was such a wild experience for me and you know the the amount of information that people were were downloading um inside of the king's chamber was like we had a whole day of integration after that night um that we spent there and then we went to the other two pyramids um minkare and Khafre. uh yeah or yeah the great pyramid is kofu uh it's it's such a <laughs> deep deep rabbit hole to talk about these you know and just as you were talking and i'm sure i can speak for other people tuning in just this deep remembrance my whole body was shaking as you were just explaining all of that and i think we all have memories from from those lifetimes and we are all now beginning to you know channel those memories back because maybe there's something that needs to be risen up to the surface um i'm not sure what that is uh it's an understanding it's a frequency maybe a teaching if you have any insight as to why now like why we're remembering so much now um yeah. you know we're going through um you know, coming out of Kali, Kali Yuga, which is just this, think of this huge rotational thing that our entire galaxy is going through. And as we round the bend, we, we've come out of the, the forgetfulness and, the, and the, the compressive phase, and we're moving into a phase of expansiveness. And in that expansion, there's more elbow room to remember. There's more, there's more spaciousness. That's why we're suddenly interested in quantum science and, and the space in between. And am I a wave or a particle? And the answer is yes, depending on what you choose. And so free will is coming into focus really in terms of how to manifest the teachings that we're learning from quantum science and, and remembering through quantum science. And, there's reasons that people are having memories and lucid awakenings and are being drawn to, to consciousness and out of body experiences because they want to experience themselves beyond this, this five, you know, sensory 3D being. And, and it's important to remember that we're supposed to find it and then do something with it. That it isn't about the phenomenal and the fantastical. It isn't about, yeah, I had this amazing, you know, totally radical experience that blew my mind. And, you know, people are into that. But, you know, let's take that and like say, okay, what did you experience? What did it mean to you? What, what are you going to do with that? How's that going to shape you? How's it going to change you? Where in your body did you get activated when you had that re remembrance or when you saw that thing? Bring it home, land it inside of you. And so that you can allow that to contribute to your gut feelings and your inner wisdom. And you gather enough of that, that it starts to come up through your heart and be filtered into something that has heart and meaning for you so that it can then arise up through your own primitive brain. And you can have brilliant discoveries and decisions. You can be a leader and you can help instruct and guide our humanity in ways that are loving, <laughs> that are productive, that are sustainable, instead of everyone being interested in, you know, something um, out of outer space or, or, or um, you know, less loving, but more extraterrestrial uh, sorts of things where, where we can be attacked or we're just expanding our battlefield. It's not about that. It's about let's turn this into a divine experience. Let's turn this into something that is sacred. Let's turn this into something that's going to be healing and, and productive. That's what we're here to train our minds to become interested in. And if we're interested enough, we will. It will happen. It will happen that way. We will heal ourselves. We will heal each other. We will stop being so obsessed with healing and get on with manifesting our true divinity. And when we do that, healing happens as a byproduct, sort of in the rearview mirror, while we're busy truly becoming our true selves. So... We're up for that. It's time for that. That's what's going on now. And it's, it's that the cycle in our own evolutionary process that is taking place that is calling this forward. And, and the, the key is let's ground it and let's integrate it 
and, and stabilize these higher frequencies so that we don't spin out and just become addicts to meditation or addicts to our ayahuasca shamanic journeys or, or whatever it might be. People are becoming addicted to meditations that are taking them up and out of their bodies uh, because it feels free. And then they have a harder time coming back into their bodies and into their lives many times because they'd rather be there instead of being here. And, and that's just further misuse of the mind, in my opinion. We're just, we just haven't mastered how to bring it all collectively. And we could. I'm teaching people how to do it. People inside my work are anchoring and embodying and integrating um, these experiences and transforming their lives without spinning out, without becoming depressed or anxious or, you know, uh, addicted to things. And they're, they're bringing brilliance and beauty and healing and um, collaboration into their workplaces and their homes and their families and these kinds of things. So we're at a choice point. It's like, are we going to grow up? Are we going to learn how to use our faculties in a mature way? Or are we going to just be obsessed with, you know, the next bright, shiny, flashy new thing? You mentioned AI. I just wanted to comment on that a little bit. Yeah. You know, my, my only concern is that it's intelligence without the soul. And so uh, it's up to us to manage that. It's up to us to make sure that what gets delivered through AI um, has heart and meaning because it can sound like it and not be that. We've all been exposed to people who can say the right things, but they're not, they're not, it's not it. They're talking about it. They're not talking from it. And, and this is what we have to be on point. We have to understand the difference between somebody, you know, saying things or doing things and, and our ability to feel uh, the connection, to feel the resonance, because you can't fake that. You can't fake that. So if we really want our artificial intelligence to do beautiful things for our humanity, we have to learn how to find soulful coherence inside of our own systems, inside of our own dashboard here that tells us what what's what. And if as we learn about that, we become the ones who can make those distinctions. Like just because we can doesn't mean we should. And so uh, we're going to have to responsibly make those choices. We're going to have to be the ones to say, that looks good and it sounds good, but I can't feel you, right? I can't feel it. And to, to truly be uh, the ones that hold the feet to the fire of artificial intelligence, you know, it's, it can be beautiful and amazing what it can do. And, you know, as with everything else that we invent and create and manifest, um, it can be used in, in both directions, right? Mm. it's like the quote of of einstein that you love of it has to be a faithful servant um for that heart space that that love that we've been talking about and i'm getting really called to bring the conversation really full circle um we started off speaking about the divine feminine and i i know last time we were together you had a trip to southern france where you take people to where Mary Magdalene went after the crucifixion. Yeah. And I'm really curious to know how, why is your connection with Mary Magdalene so deep? And what have you learned about her energy that we can bring forth into this conversation and leave people with um, that activation of Mary Magdalene uh, throughout? I feel like she's here in some way. I just felt it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So I had no, no intention of being, you know, leading Mary Magdalene tours. It was not anywhere in my, in my upbringing. It was nothing. It was nothing. And then all of a sudden it was, you're supposed to go do this. You're, it's, you're supposed to go do this. And so I planned a trip and, um, in, in the midst of moving into these spaces in these cathedrals and these basilicas that were built in, of honoring Mary Magdalene 
there were some of the most beautiful pieces of architecture and structures that were all based on sacred geometries. And, and when my third eye started opening, uh, what I could see in my internal architecture, uh, it was being reproduced in these cathedrals and these basilicas. So whoever built them, who designed them, they knew, they knew they had access to what I had access to. So it had my attention. Like I lined up in a very big way and, and recognized that this, this is true and it's, it's happening here. And it was all about the divine feminine and it was about balancing and harmonizing the divine feminine and, and bringing it forward because, uh, because of so many things. There's so many levels I could answer your question on, but I want to try to keep it in a way that is, that is easily accessible in, in the shortest amount of time. But basically what, what was being revealed was that Mary Magdalene was the embodiment of the quality of energies that cause us to catch the divine, to receive. She's the receptacle. She was more than just, uh, certainly more than a prostitute, right? Certainly more than just the consort of Jesus, which, you know, there have been many writings and research and, and opinions that have shared that they, that they were that they were together, that they, that they had children, that there was, there was an entirely different reality happening there than what we were taught in terms of, you know, really marginalizing, uh, the Mary out of it and making it all about Jesus and, and many things that really reveal that, that she was an equal teacher that they were teaching and that actually there were things that she was teaching him and that things that she was making possible for him in terms of ascension. Because what we have learned is the masculine energy alone cannot sustain itself in this realm. It has to couple. It has to marry. It has to merge with this divine feminine. And so the divine feminine energy is that which receives this this descending light. And I'm not so sure that that's masculine light that was coming in. I'm actually quite sure that the whole of the creation is feminine in nature. It's all feminine. If you put the whole universe together, it's self-sustaining, it's rebirthing itself, it's nurturing, it's, it's all encompassing. Those are all feminine qualities. And so I truly feel that there's something else really that, that could be, that the whole story could be told a little differently. Um, but it's pretty radical, so we'll save that for another time. But but let's just say the descending energy, whether it be masculine or feminine, it's caught by this receptacle. And I feel that Mary Magdalene was the embodiment feature, the the aspect of embodiment. She was the vessel that you know she's always shown with this alabaster vessel and always equated with these these anointing oils and and perfumes that are scents and 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 an essence. But I also feel that she was pointing to um, we have to vessel and contain and gather these energies and become the gathering of the divine that is descending here. And that's what this body is. And it's what I had been teaching with the toric field and, and creating a vessel where we can do the alchemizing inside of our system. And I feel that's what she was doing. And so I feel that that's why I was called. I was just guided, truly cosmically, divinely guided to go and be in this study. And here's what I love. It's such a testament to what I had been studying all this time that, that in one cathedral in particular in Paris, uh, the Madeleine, uh, there is, um, there is such a beautiful tribute to her. Um, and, uh, I had been there eight years prior just as a tourist walking in, seeing a beautiful cathedral, appreciation, amazing, you know, reverence and, you know, bought my candle, lit it and, and then left, right? And sat for a meditation and, and left. And then eight years later, after circuit building for the eight years and teaching all the things that I've been teaching people how to do that, to build the circuitry where we can truly rise and illuminate so that we can see through the third eye in a regular way. Here I was standing in the same place and I looked around and saw an entirely different message. I saw a message. I saw what was in the flooring and in the paintings and in the wallpaper and how it was all sacred geometries and the flower of life was represented and the root chakra was represented everywhere. Everything was telling us about embodiment, about you are that. You have the capacity. It isn't separate from you. It's you. It's each one of us. It's every one of us. It wasn't one. It was the oneness of all of us. That's who has this capacity for ascension. And ascension is raising your vibration so that you can perceive yourself as a cosmic, multidimensional, divine 
presence. And it's the same thing that was being taught in ancient Egypt. And it's the same thing that was being taught in ancient India. And it's the same thing that is in Greek mythology. And there it was in Christianity. And I had no idea that we actually borrowed that information from Egypt and India and, and the Greek, and, you know, and ancient Greece, that we borrowed all that inside of Christianity and, and then poo pooed all of the rest of it as paganistic and wrong. And you can only do this one thing. You can only study in this one place if you really want to get to get to God. And it was a lie. It wasn't the truth. Mm. And so Mary Magdalene is the divine feminine and she's here to help salve. She's here as, she's here as the presence of, of, of gathering and catching and holding, holding the space and grounding and anchoring and integrating and loving. And no matter what, unconditionally, no matter what, come what may, staying in the love and staying present. And so, and so, you know, here we are in yet another testy conversation about, you know, you know maybe, maybe that's going to rub some people. I hope it does. Good. You Good. Know, I hope it does because we need to be rubbed. We need to be polished and refined. We need to be a little agitated about, you know, maybe that thing, the reason I don't feel whole and complete is because I've been taught that I'm not and I'm never going to be until I get to heaven, right? And it's not the truth and I'm not okay with that. So let's do something about it. So then I go back a year later and I saw even more. I saw even more where there's so much that is right there that is just golden showing us the whole truth, the whole picture is right there. So I'm going back again um, this fall and mm. um, and uh, doing a little bit more research and I'm putting it together and I'm going to put in, you know, put it all in a book that, that just combines all of these cultures and all of these sacred sites and all of these spaces and what they are holding for us um, is is quite clear and we can access it. We can translate. We're up for it. We're made for it. And and if we're willing to give up some of our ideas of who we think we need to be, just like we've done in this conversation by talking about these, you know, these things, just saying, you know what, there's a there's a vertical reality that I'm more devoted to than anything else at this point. And I know that if we devote ourselves to that truth, that alignment, that we can dispel the confines of this horizontal world and the illusion of pain and suffering as some necessity. And we can transform that into another choice, a different way of living and being. Uh, all we have to do is lean in and allow ourselves to explore um, why we have those questions. Why are we seekers? What is that unrest? What is driving that? There, It's the truth that's driving it. It's not allowing you to settle for less than your wholeness. And it will stick, it will, it will gnaw at you until you follow, until you drop in, until you let it have its way. Because it's much more potent and powerful and eternal than your personality. It's forever. It's never going away. And it's love. It's truth. And when those two are combined, we are free. And you know, it's just a matter of al aligning ourselves to, you know, goodwill and, yeah. uh, and serving. Mm. And Dr. Sue, without your third eye opening, you would not have been able to see a lot of the things that you saw while you were in these ancient sites. Um, I wanted to ask you because in your scientific research, you found that the pineal gland is made of rods and cones. What's the significance of that? I just want people to land home. Like anyone can open this third eye. Anyone can see, can, can see these things. So what is the significance of the pineal gland having light receptors basically um, inside of the brain? Yeah, it's fabulous, right? So, <laughs> so it's perceiving a higher vibrational frequency of light than visible light. It's perceiving invisible light, meaning it's higher vibration than the bandwidth of visible, the visible light spectrum. And so, and so that's why there's no opening, right, to the outer world because it's not necessary. It's not about that. It's, it's see-through, right? It's invisible. And so it, it 
transmits through all density. It's a finer energy. It's more refined, more subtle. And so uh, what taps it is constantly, it's constantly being flooded with higher frequency energies. It's constantly perceiving and seeing and perceiving them. Now, our job is to build a strong and stable enough foundation underneath the pineal that we can stay with stability, allow it to receive and perceive and allow it to receive and perceive information coming up from the earth up through this system because we've built our own circuitry to be able to support and sustain it so that we can then see and action into this world from a higher vibrational reality where, which allows us to cut through the veils and to see the lies and to walk straight into a greater truth, which is peaceful, which is harmonized, etc. So this third eye is, is something of interest and people should be interested in it. They should also be interested in anchoring themselves in their body and cultivating their deep core wisdom and opening their solar plexus to their heart and allowing their solar plexus wisdom center beneath it and uh, and their root chakra beneath that to be so stable and so solid, only made possible by them living as that, not knowing about it, but knowing themselves as that, as those energies, those qualities, and then something starts to rise. And what rises is us, the true self, the soulful self rises. And as that true soulful self rises, it begins to manifest itself through the throat chakra. It begins to come through a birth canal and coming through this birth canal here versus where we've been nurturing and cultivating ourselves. We, we compress and concentrate and create potency about ourselves enough that we can break open a trap door between the subconscious and the conscious and move into this cave of creativity in the ventricular system in the center of the brain where the pineal sits. Because when the pineal is flooded with a chemistry that is a regulated autonomic nervous system, it gets flooded with a stability that allows it to open. It's a vibrational frequency combination lock, if you will. And so as it opens, it emits higher vibrational frequency versions of some of our hormonal system. It has a transmuting effect on melatonin and it starts to shift and change our ability to remain in a peaceful, loving state no matter what because we see the whole truth, the more we learn more information, the more comfortable we are, right? The more we, you know, I just need to find out more information. I can't sign that thing yet because I just need to learn more. I need to do some research, I need to ask, whatever. When we have more information, we feel more comfortable, more confident, when we perceive more of reality. And so as this third eye is opening, we're perceiving more and more and more. So we have more information to base our decisions on and our decisions become based on creator creating not survivor surviving. It's a very different reality. We are creator creating in truth. We are not survivor surviving. Survival and safety is not the end game. It's a perceived game until it's not. And when we start to awaken, we realize that safety is not a good enough goal. It has nothing to do with anything. We're not unsafe. We just perceive ourselves to be unsafe because we're running on limited circuitry. That's why I'm teaching people how to build the circuitry to allow for this upswell of an energy, a chemistry, a liquid light, a presence, the soulful self to rise up in a stable manner so that the floor of this cave of Brahma where the third eye sits, where the pineal gland sits, is receiving information that allows the thing to open that allows the third eye to open. So as it does, we can perceive more information and we can remember. And the key to that is to know this. It doesn't have to all happen at once. It can happen incrementally. Don't rule things out. Don't push the river because pushing the river keeps it from opening. If, and if you're trying to make it happen, it won't happen. But if you're loving, and you're staying present with yourself and you're learning how to build these circuitries and you're, you're, you're present and your essence is breathing and you're in it and you're allowing it to rise on its own accord and you're vesseling and gathering like the Magdalene would do and you're, you're, you're enhancing your experience with love like the ancient Egyptians did and you're 
being present in a harmonized way, the way that ancient Indians told us to do in Eastern India. And you're allowing all of these attributes to come together at one time that creates the perfect combination for you to know, for you to know. And when you do, um, you are remembering the truth of who you are. You're remembering it. And it comes with comfort and ease and grace. You cannot make it happen, force it to happen. You can go out and have out-of-body experiences and wake up your 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 mind. You can have all sorts of shamanic journeys and not poo-pooing that at all. Just make sure that you're learning how to bring that home and do something with it so that it doesn't take your whole lifetime to figure out what that one experience was meant to bring to you that you can in integrate and you can interpret. See, the body is a filtering system and it allows us to filter these things into words and ideas and projects and, and images that make sense to us, even to our logical minds that are blown pretty much when we're having these, these mystical experiences. But, but just know that you don't have to have a mystical experience in order to awaken. You don't have to have your third eye lucidly visually see things differently in order for you to become lucid and awake in the ways that I'm speaking. And if you do have those things, then what I'm speaking about will help you integrate those experiences in a way that's relevant, in a way that makes a difference in your life. You know, I had these openings 25 years ago, and and until I got in my body with them, they did not change my life. They changed my mind. They changed my reality, but they didn't change how I was in relationship. It didn't change how I was as a self-healer. It didn't change my ability to help other people heal. I just I just saw some stuff, right? But when it began to heal my scoliosis and my migraine headaches and allow me to heal broken bones without traditional methods and allowed me to come all this time in my life without having to be on a medication or never taken an antibiotic, that what changed was when I got in my body with what I had seen, with what I had become aware of. Then it became enlivened and real. It became tangible and alive as me instead of something that I knew about or read about, you know, it, it's not that, it's it's different. We're here to become that, the very thing that we're seeking. Mm. Dr. Sue, I am in awe, <laughs> I am in wonder of you, and you know, the words are just the costume, and what really is happening here, and I really wanna invite people to receive the frequency, receive the transmission, the activation, because I've been feeling it throughout my whole body, this whole conversation. And as you just said, grounding that in, if they need to listen to this a couple more times to like just ground it in, um, I invite people to see beyond the words, see beyond mm -hmm. just the vocabulary, the nuances that we're using, um, because this is a transmission and I honor you for that and for going to places where Maybe there was a little bit of fear of going there, but ah. thank you for breaking through that. Um, that's why we're here. We're here to hold a uh, loving, non-judgmental space. Um, I would really want to send people your way. Um, do you have any new projects going on? Where would you send people to connect with you even further? Oh, beautiful. So, yes, um, uh, we're, we're pretty easy to find. It's drsuemorter.com. It's D-R-S-U-E-M-O-R-T-E-R. Dot com website will direct you lots of places. We're getting ready to build a new website, so uh, but it'll be the same address. And you'll be able to find us, but we're revamping and you know making super easy access. We have all sorts of online programming, and we do also have in-person events. A uh, big one in September called Ignite in-person event will be in Scottsdale. Um, have a big online program. Uh, where thousands of people from around the world, 115 countries are coming together to leverage our power together for three days. It's called Heal Yourself, Heal Your Life. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really about awakening. And uh, and I love to teach it because it's just so power packed and, and filled with juice in uh, all these ways that we're speaking about. Um, so that's a great way for people to plug in and get started with things that I do. Um, but I also have the book, The Energy Codes, and um, many, many programs. So, you know, just write to us at info at if you have questions or if we can be of service in any way, because we are here yes. to truly awaken and embody uh, the consciousness that is meant to be in humanity. Mm. 
Yeah. And heal yourself, heal your life. They will find the link in the description where they can sign up to that. And I would also invite people to watch our first interview together here on the podcast. And we also did a TV show, a TV uh, episode together uh, called Awaken the Sixth Sense. So how do we activate our psychic abilities um, if they want to learn more about that in specific? We have three rapid fire questions to end off every show. Um, you can answer this in any way that you want, but yeah. these are pretty short questions. So what in particular are you most in awe of about the whole universe? It's perfection. It's ever rolling, enfolding perfection. It's all there. It is so beautiful. It's magical. Yes. yes. And what is your greatest superpower? Beginning again. And finally, what is your greatest understanding of love? It's the universal solvent. It solves everything. Nothing can survive in the presence of love. It's the greatest power on earth. Aho. Dr. Sue, it's always an honor, a pleasure. Uh, millions of other words I could describe right now to, to transmit what I'm feeling um, of having this conversation with you. So I know we will continue this beautiful collaboration and friendship. Uh, sister, thank you so much. I see you for just activating, being an activator, a way shower, and inspiring us younger people and whoever's tuning in to continue their journey of awakening, of ascension and embodiment. So thank you a million times. And we will have to do this again. We just scratched the surface. <laughs> I know. I know there were other places I can go. So <laughs> we'll go there sometime. Uh, thank we you. Will. I want to thank you too, Emilio. You are you're an amazing presence and thank you so much for bringing people together in the ways that you do and having the interest that you do. It is, um, it's a beautiful thing to see. And so I really appreciate, um, being connected with you as well. It, it is, it's time for us to make, you know, a way for people to truly wake up and we have, we have the tools to do that. So thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to come back anytime course thank you